from Adam's house and Gina's house and Brian's house, this is the Adam Carolla Show. Adam's guest today, Clay Aiken, with Gina Grad on news, Bald Brian on sound effects, and Dave Damashek's here for good sports. And now, Gypsy Potion Queen, Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice, we're going to mandate. Get it on. Must have had a lot of clients today. <laughs> Good day, Gina Grad. <laughs> Good day to you. And Bald Brian. I've Cinco de Mayo. Oh, happy Cinco, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, many thoughts, things to share. Um, I was talking to Dr. Drew for a while, which always uh, inspires some thought. And I had a couple of things I kind of came up with, which is this. You know, the more you hear about this and talking to Dr. Katz yesterday, it kind of struck me when he was saying an ambulance would, you know, pick up someone at a nursing home and take them to the emergency room. And I was like, oh yeah, I never really pictured, in my mind, it was always like healthy people in an ambulance going to the emergency room. That's, I don't know, an ambulance ride and the emergency room always feels in my mind like somebody got in a bad motorcycle accident. Right. Yeah. And Something's now they take, in. yeah, someone's on vacation in Aruba and they're on a moped and they got into an accident. Now they're getting in an ambulance, you know. But I never really picture the nursing home to the hospital. Yeah. And, and Drew said, er, the only way you're transported from a nursing home is in an ambulance. And I kept right. thinking, yeah, all this death but kind of without context is what's been really working on everybody, including myself. And I started kind of picturing, and, and also if we ever start getting into this, if one person dies and that's one person too many, then we don't really, we don't, we're not gonna arrive at anything. We can't settle anything, we can't figure it out. But I was thinking about it earlier in the day. And I, I said, you know, if you were at the if you were at the hospital with your husband or wife when your first child was born, and then when they were done with the birthing and the cutting of the umbilical cord and the swaddling and everything, now came the part where you and your wife or you and your husband had to go into the room and spin a giant wheel, and the giant wheel was a big kind of Price is Right kind of wheel. And on that wheel, it had the number 19, uh, 52, and 87. And that would be the year Mom, your, your newborn would die. Yeah. I said, it's not like you would, if it spun it and it landed on 19, you would be devastated. If it landed on 52, you would be less devastated. And if it landed on 87, you'd be jumping up and down and hugging each other. Right. And if your wife was standing there with her arms folded and going, well, wait a minute, one death is one death too many. And 87 is 87, but it's still before 90. You'd literally be high-fiving every nurse running up and down the hall. I mean, how hard would you be pulling for 87 if you spun my mythical wheel? And when you die in a nursing home, that's kind of landing on that wheel. We all know people, mm -hmm. all had friends or, you know, the guys I went to high school with who bought it on motorcycle accidents at literally at 18 or 19. You know, we have that famously uh, Robert and Lenny, my two buddies died at 19 in a, in a car crash on the way to Cal State Northridge. Like, so if you picture that, that exercise of, having the birth of your son or daughter, then walking to the next room and spinning that wheel. If you would be jumping up and down, if it got to 87, then we can't plan our society for the demise of the 87s. And we can't be as devastated as we react because there is a difference between 19 and 87. Um, so that was my morbid wheel of death. Um, I also a huge was- difference. Well, I, look, here's, the, here's why, because- When the guy look, dies, you pee on his wallet. <laughs> there, is no, there is no piece of the pie that says, uh, 
that says live for, for forever. There, there is no, there is no, there's only three. There's young, there's medium, and there's old. And that's all we have. Uh, that's all we have. That's all mm-hmm. anyone listening has. That's all anyone who'll ever be born has. It's not a, you know, it's not a if, it's a when. But we want to stave off the when as far as, as far as humanly possible, obviously, or as long as hum- humanly possible. But there is no fourth slot on that wheel that, that says um, immortality. Singularity. Mm-hmm. Right. So with that in mind, if you're jumping up and down and high-fiving at 87, then keep that in mind as we, as we move forward with the pandemic. Also, um, I was saying to Drew as well, I'd also come up with this sort of um, concept, which is uh, uh, fear gear. We have a gear called fear, and we put it into the fear gear, but you don't want to use that fear gear that often. Someone's been watching the trailer for the new Top Gun. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I got a well, gear. <laughs> fear. <laughs> what do you feel the need for? Fear. No. No, no. 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 Take two. <laughs> you feel the need for speed, and you're going to put the Russians in fear gear. <laughs> so um, the fear gear, I, I realize that it's always there. And if you picture kind of a old stick shift car, you can find it, but you're not supposed to go into that gear that often. It's kind of reserved for when you're walking down the street and you hear something in the shrub and it could be a bear or something like that. Like, let's not, let's not shift it into the fear gear as often as we do. And I was uh, thinking about, it's kind of funny, like when I was young, younger, trucks, back when trucks were manuals, some of them came with what they called a granny gear. Now, I don't mm-hmm. know if any of Brian's no. S10s ever had the granny gear. No, I learned to drive on a stick, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, no one ever called it the granny gear. So I don't know what that is. That's your face. The truck, <laughs> a lot of trucks, maybe like, I, I remember moving a guy's Ford F-150 was up on a hill or something when I was working, you know, when I was 19 or something. There's first gear. And then there's a gear that's even lower than first gear. It's called granny oh, gear. Didn't know and about that. The granny gear, so they call it, is not supposed to be used very often, and you don't need to use it very often. But if you've got a trailer and, or you're parked on an incline oh. with a full load mm-hmm. of plywood in the back of your truck, you go even lower wow. so you can get moving. But it's, it's not the kind of thing you, you slide into that often under mm-hmm. normal circumstances. So I was kind of thinking about the granny gear versus the fear gear. And it's <laughs> like, ironic it's that it's there, <laughs> right? It's there, but don't shift into it that often. And I think right. part of what we're seeing is people sit home and just watch the news and they watch the news and watch the news and they're sh- sliding it into fear gear and spending long periods of time in fear gear, that fear gear is there, use it on occasion, use it to get going or slow down or whatever it is, but don't stay in it for as long as we're staying right. in it. To burn it out, to burn yourself yes. out. Well, and, and to your point about burning it out, it's I, when you're saying that, I'm thinking, am I in fear gear? Am I in granny gear? And I don't know what it is, but I don't know if I just passed granny gear and went right into like desensitized shutdown mode because you know I'm dealing with the news all day and I hear it and I see it and it just, it's like, it doesn't look like anything to me anymore. You're a neutral. Yeah, well, well you're it all... doesn't even feel neutral. It feels, it feels absent or desensitized. It's not a great feeling either, you know? Well, nothing's better than something negative, I guess. You, you, you have a sense of purpose though. Like you're working, you're moving, like you just, you can't stew in your own juices very oh, long. Would that you know? I could. <laughs> the, the purpose when I mean, you have yeah. purpose i mean you know devil makes work for idle hands but man right. does it like when you're just down right you don't have a schedule anymore it's like so easy just to slide in that weird fear abyss uh i was thinking about it because um i woke up this morning i had a email just one of those sort of mass emails from adam schiff who's our representative out here <laughs> and the beginning of the email and i've heard this a lot now which is um god i wrote it down here somewhere it, it it's this um morbid milestone like this is huh. the new terminology we're sure. at this morbid milestone you know and the beginning of this 
was I'll just have Dawson read the top two lines because I thought this is gonna this is gonna shift people, pardon the pun, into into the fear gear. Oh, it's a grim milestone. Sorry, mm-hmm. a grim milestone. Sorry, Go ahead, Dawson. Adam, this week we reached yet another grim milestone in the coronavirus pandemic, as almost seventy thousand Americans have died as a result of it. We can't allow ourselves to become numb to the terrible toll this virus is taking on our nation and the world. Hold on. (laughs) First off, is anyone not aware of this? Like, become numb to it. Wait, what? Why can't we become numb to it? You're fucking beating us over the head with it all fucking day. You never stop. And also, last I checked, I don't know that you say we've reached another grim milestone of almost 70,000. I feel like, call me when we get to 70,000, bitch. Wait, wait for it. This is premature ejaculation of the milestones here. We, if we've almost reached it, then we haven't reached it. I'll call me at 70, even if I'm asleep and, (laughs) and, and then I'll wring my hands. God, we can't forget. Like, yeah, first off, everyone is doing everything. So why do we have to make ourselves miserable along the way? And uh, I just thought, grim milestone. That's a new one. I've seen it. I've seen it in articles. I've seen Mm -hmm. it on TV shows. Mm -hmm. I don't remember a lot of grim milestone (laughs) discussions, but here we are. And boy, are we in love with fear. God, do we love it or we need it or we're like crazed by it or something. And we're in love with the new normal. This is the new normal. Yes. Grim milestones are part of the new normal. Yeah. Um, On a happy note, uh, uh, Clay Aiken's going to join us, who's one one of my just favorites. I'm just so impressed with that guy. And I I also wasn't even aware that uh, he's in my book. (laughs) Now you can one? say, how come you don't you read? know? <laughs> yeah, I don't Hand know. Wrote. I talk so goddamn much. I don't know what's in and what's out anymore. But Dawson grabbed a clip. It's just a minute long clip, I guess. Yeah, this is part of uh, your presidential predictors uh, oh. section. All right. Here it goes. Clay Aiken. He's already taken a stab at politics in his home state of North Carolina. Much like with Celebrity Apprentice and American Idol, he didn't win, but should have. He's an incredibly substantial person, as I learned in the few weeks I spent with him before I got booted off. You learn quickly from doing the Celebrity Apprentice who's got it and who doesn't. It's a little like the punt pass and kick competition. You can't be good at just one thing. They come in and throw you a task, and you have to decide who's the leader, which assignments fall on which people all while keeping your cool. You have 48 hours to make a bunch of correct decisions under enormous pressure. Then you have to go into the boardroom and get reviewed. That's how all of life should operate, especially political leadership. You work hard and smart, and then you're held accountable. The ability to delegate, work under stress, rise to challenges, and take criticism are all good presidential qualities, and I'm telling you, Clay has them. Wow. It's ironic that you're talking about Clay for president. I know. Clay for president. I I was so impressed. Look, it's really, you know, the thing with the Celebrity Apprentice, like you walk, I walked out of that place. I was like, Clay Aiken, that guy's a crackerjack. Lou Ferrigno, that guy's a puss. (laughs) Like, That's what you learn (laughs) from doing Celebrity Apprentice. And you would have no idea in a million years that Clay Aiken would be a stalwart stud and Lou would be a puss until you did Celebrity Apprentice. You'd guess just the opposite. I think you probably, if you certainly if you had a picture of both of them with their shirt (laughs) off, I don't know why we have to take a turn for the homoerotic, but I feel like if you played the original Hulk, that that rules are rules, but you would have no idea that Lou was wired like Lou and Clay was wired like, like clay no and uh Uh, yes yeah no i'm just i'm curious because you both have had these incredibly well not to take a turn for the homoerotic but intimate experiences with the president of the united states i'm curious what clay's thoughts are between the man that hosted the show and the man that's running the country well it's funny i I was looking down on his bio uh before we came on the air 
And I did remember him saying it before, possibly on this show, where he says Trump has changed a lot. I don't, I don't feel he's changed a lot, but I don't, he's not a guy you, you don't really know him. So it'd be hard to say like you changed, you right. know, it's this sort of struck me as this kind of, uh, you, you know, I guess, I guess my number one Trump quality that people don't attribute to him that, but I would, would be impatient. Mm. All no. most okay. builders and developers are impatient people. And it's really something I've personally taken some stock of, which has been nice, which is I like- I need this wall yesterday. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, when I was at the height of my, you know, when I was 35 and I was building a house, it was like, come on, come on, come on, what, what, come on. And then you'd get something where it'd be like, all it is is one big setback and disappointment. Like the city says you got to hire a deputy inspector and uh, that's about a two week process. You know, like, come on, come on. I mean, I hung famously my big mirrored closet doors the morning after my hernia surgery. Well, partly because I felt fine and partly because, you know, I want to make some hay while the sun was shining. But if you really look at that act, it was impatience. I had ordered these big glass mirrors, big framed mirrors that were mirrors. Or, you know, if you ever go into a higher end mirror store, you can make a custom mirror for over your mantelpiece or your bedroom or whatever it is. Now there's, you know, go to Ikea and buy a mirror and then there's going to the framing place. And the framing place, you pick out the trim and then you tell them whether you want it beveled or whatever it is. And then you go, my mantelpiece is six foot three inches and a quarter across. I want it exactly as wide as the mantle and we're gonna put it above the whatever. And it's like, I don't know, it was like five weeks or something. And I was like going out of my mind, like, hurry, hurry, hurry. Where, where is that? Where is that? Where is it? And uh, it, like I told you guys, it showed up, uh, of course, the day I went in to get hernia surgery. And when I was, I don't know, 30, God, let's see when I was, I was 36, 35 or 36. I just woke up that morning and go, the fucking mirrors are there. I'm hanging them. And that's because I was impatient. Well, how much of it was, um, there's impatience, of course, how much of it was uh, defiance to Dr. True, who said you would not be up and around the next day? Hmm. <laughs> I'm sure there's an element of that. Like Brian, who had the audacity to keep living 10 years, 11 yeah. years later. Yeah, fuck that. Tumor. I didn't, you know, it sounds like something I would do, but I, I didn't, it wasn't what was on my mind when I got up in the morning. I got mm. up in the morning, I went to bed, knowing that those things had been delivered to the house and they were just sort of leaning against the wall. I had the weird experience of because of going under at five in the afternoon and the medication and all that kinds, of, I had the weird timing experience of going to bed at like 9.30 or something, mm -hmm. which I, I'd go to bed at two, you know? So then I woke up at 6.15, like sort of like, <laughs> what, what day is it? Like what's going on? And uh, first thing upon my head was those mirrors. <laughs> and I, but, but it's an impatience and yeah. it comes with developing things and building things. And it's not that good. It, 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 it's not comfortable. I, I remember having this thought yesterday. I was waiting on some railings or some stairs or whatever. And it's like a five week wait or whatever. And I remember thinking, well, it'll show up when it shows up and then I'll put it in. And then I kind of went like, that feels better because I was constantly like, come on, yeah. go, go, go. And um, that's what Trump felt like to me, felt impatient all the time. And Sorry. that was- I wonder that if Clay like, picked that up. That'd be interesting to talk to him about it, but I didn't notice a, a big trans, transition or transformation from this Trump to uh, that Trump. And also I think part of being impatient is not being a very good listener because mm. <laughs> you go like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Here anyway. we go. Yeah. <laughs>
Right. Well, it's been it's been pretty widely reported, or just uh, for years, that like uh, the Trump's aides have had to resort to doing like almost like flashcards, like put everything on one. You know, don't give him detailed reports. He's not going to read them. Put them on one piece of paper. You know, with graphics or whatever, because he's got. You know, he's like you said that that would make sense. He's impatient. Yeah, it's kind of uh, it's kind of interesting because I'm very beat oriented. Like, don't give me the big Bible and verse of everything. Right. Just give me the beats. I'll tell you. You tell me. I'll remember it. Say it to me. Don't have me read it. Like it's a quick beat, beat, beat. I'll I'll ingest it. And yes, and it and it often it often rubs people the wrong way mm. <laughs> because like Matt will Matt will get on the phone with me, Matt the Porcelain Punisher Fondalier, and uh, he'll say something like. I talked to Barry and they're going to reschedule for next year. And I'll go next. Okay. Next. And he'll want to finish what he's saying. You know, yeah, like he'll go, <laughs> Barry was very apologetic. I'll just go next, next. What's next. And, and it's kind of rude, <laughs> but it's not really meant to be rude. I just, right. I don't want to talk about Barry and he felt really bad. Like I, I don't need that part of the story. I just yeah. need the part where it's rescheduled. You got it. And it's next. Yeah. And it's also a little of, that's not going to work that good at the dinner table. I feel like when during in the in the work week when it's with your assistant, maybe you can get away with it. You'd be a great uh, uh, priest at a, in a confessional. <laughs> next, next, don't care, not a big deal. Out, stop wasting my time. Your quote unquote sins. Yeah, and then uh, it'd be like, yeah, it'd be like, I mean, yeah, it'd be like this. So, um, here, uh, Brian. Yeah. You be the uh, you be the uh, young boy. I'm oh, not sure. the young boy. I'll make you the let, confessor. Let's make you the confessor, but let's make you 19. Okay. And uh, let's have you explain to me that you used the Lord's name in vain a couple sure. of times. That you did not honor your father and didn't oh, honor your mother. A few of those, and then at some point, let's talk about uh, having. Um, Unpure sex Impure with thoughts. your hot girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, right. No, sex with the girlfriend. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Uh, forgive me, Hi, father. my son. How long's uh, it for, been? Now? It's Sorry. been. Uh, oh my gosh, uh, at least a month is my last. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, forgive me, father, for yeah, I yeah, have sinned. Right. Go. Sinned. Um, right. I uh, I've defied my my parents. Mm. I uh, yeah. did not. That happens to the best of us. Well, uh, pff, five hammer. What else? Okay. Um, uh, I I, talk, I took the Lord's name in vain yeah, on yeah, multiple occasions. Yeah, yeah, the, the Bible's not even clear on that. I think it's misinterpreted. Anyway, yeah, good. We're good. Okay. Um, okay. Well, uh, do uh, a hail mary. I, do like two hail marys for that one or something. Okay. Um, this is great. They're very efficient. Um, yeah. The, uh, here we go. Uh, oh, but this is a big one. I have oh. had. Um, uh, 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 lustful thoughts. In fact, uh, mar uh, sex out of marriage uh, with my girlfriend. Uh, uh, Tammy said her. Sorry, in the rectory. Well, this is supposed to be anonymous, right? Ooh. You're not supposed to technically really know who I. I got eyeballs. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Tam. Yeah. What'd you do, yeah, you do with her? What'd you have? Oral? Well, yeah, a couple times. Yeah. Yeah. Then, All right. Uh, slow so, down. Slow, slow it down. Oh, okay. Um, uh, some, some well, well the, 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 uh, let me check the shirt my, stuff and check my wristband here. And, um, and, uh, there's uh, a, I think there's a difference between um, you performing on her because oh, that's okay. only going to get you a couple of Hail Marys. Uh, but then there's oh. her, her performing on you. Oh, so the, yeah. there's a different, uh, different scales. Okay, well, then, um, yeah, yeah. she performed on me, I guess, Hold a, a, a couple second. of times. Hold on, there's that guy yeah. wants to get in there. Hey, wait your turn. <laughs> I don't care. Whatever, however long it takes. That's how Occup long. Occupied. Sorry, go ahead. It's not going to take very long, apparently. Um, yeah. the, uh, and then uh, some finger stuff. I, uh, I don't want to get too graphic. Uh, father. Uh, it's but, all right. Uh, I've been around the block a few times. I, I remember what it's like to be young. Don't you? Speaking don't of the fingers. Have, that, uh, don't you have to take a vow of celibacy? Hold the fingers up to the screen. Let me get a whiff. My fi the, the fingers I used on her? <laughs> Well, I'm just saying, if you want to really, uh, you know, explore this sin, you, you can't just do it through uh, uh, audibly. I, All right. Well, here, here, you go. here you go. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a sin. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, slow down. Where were we? 
I had just described to you the, the things that I was confessing, mm. the sexual yeah. acts. And mm. yeah. This is we making me very uncomfortable, Father. This is yeah. making me very uncomfortable. She, she performed on you, though, huh? Right? Yeah, a couple of times. Mm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, hold on a second. I know they got another guy here. I you use the Lord's name in vain. You did three Hail Marys. Wait, fucking check the chart, would you? Are you doing another Sorry. confession at the same time? Is there someone on the other side of your booth? You know, when you're at the hardware store and the guy's looking for a part behind the counter and then the phone rings and he kind of tells the guy, like, hold on or just come in or that's a three eighths coupler. That's kind of what I just did there. But with Oh, God. okay. Well, it's mm -hmm. very efficient. Then, I guess, it's yes, yeah. it's occupied. Please. Sorry. No, what was that? She was very going busy down, parishioners yeah. you have. <laughs> she was going. All right, end scene. Um, I don't know. I don't even know what got us there. We? <laughs> we're oh, in a, hurry. in a hurry. In a hurry. Patience. Yeah. Yeah. No patience. That's uh, yeah. that's that's what I got. Everyone would get. Everyone would get into the boardroom. Everyone would be everywhere, and then at the very last second, he would just blow in and get sort of caught up right. and then just blow through it and then just blow out of there again. Uh, let's was it, see. Do you think the kids were like that or were they compensating the other way? Like get everything ready for him or, you know, because Ivanka seems very still. You know, like she doesn't blow I, it out. I found her remarkably composed. Right. I thought she was like very well put together. She kind of reminded me of... Uh, in the beginning of heart to heart when uh i thought max, you were gonna say <laughs> max the butler if you can find the beginning of heart to heart he's like that's mr hot he's a millionaire and then he's like that's and then they show like stephanie powers i think that's mrs hot she's beautiful like he was like and she's driving her convertible uh mercedes and kicking ass and i remember like when i was 12 i was like god damn look at that chick good looking put together throwing kicks like she's that so uh she's like mrs hart i think is, okay, is how you I, I would describe her um the the sons let's see donald and uh eric, eric they were just kind of pretty good but kind of finding their way a little bit like a little bit younger or something didn't didn't strike me as is quite as gifted, but she really struck me as mm. well put together. Maybe even better than Mrs. Hart. Oh, I come on. I don't Watch know. Do we have the beginning of that, Max or Pata? Yeah. It's such a crazy know. era to be watching TV, especially you have to picture all of this through the lens of Adam Carolla, who's sitting in his 100-year-old shack in North <laughs> Hollywood on his dad, on his stepdad's like pull out sofa bed, wa watching a black and white TV in what is the den and my stepfather's bedroom simultaneously with our, you know, no air, one bedroom house and my mom in the next room with her roots all grown out gray and like a stripe of weird dyed red hair put put on her and, and and yelling freak out this is what i was watching on tv now Sorry. that's a grim milestone yes private jet this is my boss jonathan hart a self-made millionaire he's quite a guy this is mrs h she's gorgeous she's one lady who knows how to take care of herself yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right by the way my name is max so when i get a picture of my mom and just slug it in there <laughs> she's gorgeous mrs h she's, she's one <laughs> lady that knows how to take care of it i was like who is this crime fighting couple <laughs> they're just rich they're totally into each other i you gotta watch that show to get a little shot of what the 70s and 80s was all about <laughs> i was uh one of my favorite quarantine activities is watching love boat <laughs> and I, I love that I've turned Dr. Drew onto Love Boat because what I, what he doesn't understand is that Dr. Adam Bricker, the ship's doctor, was nailing all of the passengers on the ship. He was and in the he, best position. He was heralded as a hero for having <laughs> sex with the passengers. You can do the time. The time can do you, man. That's right. 
All oh, right, good. Hard. Clay Aiken is uh, on hold. So yeah. let me just hit uh, Shady Rays here. High quality shades for far less and uh, than all those expensive brands, which are really expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, not the big corporation that uh, overcharges premium. Polarized shades built for the outdoors and uh, back for life. One of the best warranties in the industry. Replacements, if it's lost or broken for any reason, and lifetime craftsmanship warranty as well. And most of the uh, Shady Rays start at just 48 bucks. Um, I have the best story about these sunglasses in terms of like the testimonial. I told you guys last weekend, I took Sunny to uh, PCH. And okay. those of you who have been following it know that there's all this algae in the water that's yes. making all this- The bioluminescence. Bioluminescence. Oh, but yeah. when you're on top of PCH and you're coming down that long hill and you're just looking to the left and you're looking at the water, you can see all the algae. And Sonny is wearing the Shady Rays. He's not a sunglasses guy, but I said, try these on before we left the house. And he's wearing them the whole time. He looks like baby driver with those things. And he come over the hill and he goes, oh, look at all the algae. algae. That's amazing. And then at some point, he took the Shady Rays off, like just looked as like, what would it look like that? And then he looked and he goes, you can't see it when you take the sunglasses oh, off. And wow. then he goes, you put it on and it's so defined, you know? And I was like, mm -hmm. good, I'm using that in a spot. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, by the way, uh, so most of them start at 48 bucks and everyone loves theirs. I wear mine as well. And uh, they'll also provide 10 meals to fight hunger in America with every order, Shady Rays. Right, Dawson? All right, we'll take a quick break. One of my favorites, uh, Clay Aiken, is up next. You disagree on everything. Agree on Adam Carolla's I'm Your Emotional Support Animal. Tim Allen says, Adam has written a funny, insightful book with a powerful message a bunch of people will manage to be offended by without reading it. Pre-order I'm Your Emotional Support Animal now at adamcarolla.com. Clay Aiken, one of my favorites, is on with us, his podcast. How the heck are we going to get along? I did this show a few weeks. I guess it was episode three. Been about a month or something. New episodes every Thursday on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Clay, good to speak to you. Likewise. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, I have, uh, as you know, so much respect for uh, you and your ability. I, I don't that, know what That makes me question your judgment, but I appreciate it. <laughs> <No, I, laughs> Oh, he's a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I am so into a motor. I love a motor in people. It's so attractive to me, like people that just hustle. And uh, uh. Clay has that motor to him. <laughs> and I don't know why it's so attractive to me. Maybe because I come from a bunch of ice sculptures for parents <laughs> that there's something about that motor. You know, watching my parents melt for 50 years didn't seem like a good plan, but Clay and the motor. But Clay, where did you get the motor? I don't know. I'm sitting, I'm thinking myself, I, you know, I, I have challenged all the time now because I'm trying my best to raise a kid, an 11 year old. Um, and, and I think sometimes that some of the things that I hated about my parents in hindsight, I have to appreciate, right? You know, they weren't that easy on me and I had to figure a lot of stuff out on my own. So, uh, I think I, I think I probably got a little bit of it from being forced to problem solve by myself when I was older, or when I was younger. What kind of parents did you have? I know you had a stepdad who yeah, we stepdad kind of talked about that. trying to work the gay out of you, but yeah, uh, he, well, but you know, I mean, but uh, yeah, that wasn't the greatest thing in the world, but um, <laughs> <laughs> and it did not work either. But <laughs> but um, you know, in hindsight, even though I think his motivation was not great in that regard. I have come to recognize that, the, appreciate the fact that the, I'm right now in the middle of, well, I've kind of given up a little bit, but it, of renovating a house. I got a place in Raleigh to, to use when I'm not in New York and thought I'd get something that was in good shape structurally, but cosmetically was a hot mess. And I, and I decided I'd do a lot of it myself. So, you know, basic rewiring of light sockets and, and, that kind of stuff I can do on my own. I ripped the deck out. I did that by myself. And some of these things that I can do by myself, 
I wouldn't have been able to do if he hadn't tried to turn me straight. <laughs> <laughs> well, did was he was that in your interpretation of it or did he actually yeah. make that proclamation? Well, he died before I came out to myself, so he didn't make the proclamation. Although I think when, you know, in the early 90s and the late 80s, sissy was probably used a few times. So I think he probably knew. I mean, it is my interpretation of it, right? I mean, he, he, didn't, he didn't know from me, at least, that I was gay. But I look back at it, and I think he knew before I did. He definitely knew that unlike um, my brothers, his sons, um, I, was, I was, it was definitely not as tough as they were. <laughs> yeah, well, tougher than Lou Ferrigno, yeah. as uh, <laughs> cited at the ass, top of the sure. show. <laughs> it's always, it, it, I marvel at how delicate his wiring was. Right? Well, right. you know, there's a certain, I did learn a little bit after that. I, I told myself after that whole experience that there were certain things that I wanted to make sure I never did in this world. And, and being a certain age and still carrying eight by 10 glossies of myself from 40 years prior was one of the things mm -hmm. that I did not want to do <laughs> when Brian, I got to be 70. <laughs> Brian, you've been making noises. You got, I, 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 got I, just, I just had this notion, Clay, you, you know about this obviously more than I do, but I had this notion and maybe you could tell me if I'm right or wrong, but this, the idea that like, as a kid, you can be not traditionally tough. You could be into music as opposed to sports. But one of the toughest things anyone will ever go through is being an out gay person in America, especially in the South. You know what I mean? Like it, would, it would strike me that you would have to be incredibly tough to be an out gay person, and especially in parts of the country that aren't as tolerant about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I... This is one of the, Adam and I don't agree on a lot of stuff, but this is one thing that I do agree with you on a lot, Adam, and that is that I think in general, society has gotten weaker and more easily offended by things. I look at stuff now and think, God, why is it that I'm not bothered by some of the, st like seeing stuff all about me on Twitter or reading something, someone commenting something really nasty on an Instagram post. Why am I not bothered? Because everybody else I know seems to just really get their pants in a wad every time someone looks at them cross-eyed. And I don't, I don't know if it had anything to do with being out and gay or not, because I also think that I probably, you know, I had a cloak of celebrity on me and mm. I have to admit that I had some celebrity privilege, if you want to call it that, because I was out and gay and in a medium-sized city where people all knew who I was or who know who I am and probably were more interested in kind of starstruck by meeting someone they'd seen on TV and they weren't willing to be as homophobic <laughs> to more my face. More excited about a famous person than a gay person. Yeah, probably. You know, <laughs> I, I used to, when I ran for Congress, I used to say you can only be one hyphenate. You're either going to be the black candidate, the Muslim candidate, the gay candidate. I was the Hollywood celebrity candidate, and that kind of made the gay thing be the secondary piece of it. And so I think I maybe I'm just oblivious to it. Maybe people are homophobic around me all the time, and I'm just oblivious to it. But I don't get, I just, I'm, there are too many other things in life to be upset about than to be upset that someone calls you gay or gives you shit for that, you know? Well, I completely concur. And, you know, be, we were talking about, I think, earlier in the week, but like being bullied is sort of a choice. You don't have mm. to be a victim. You can have things done to you. You can have things said about you. People can put their hands on you. I grew up in that world, but I, I never thought of myself as a victim. And I never right. thought of them as bullies. I thought of them as assholes <laughs> right. who were trying to do things to me that I didn't want them to do. But I never thought they were bullies because if they're bullies, then that makes me bullied. Right. And, and I being never offended. Think of it that way. And being offended is a choice too. You know, yeah. people get offended by things. And I say to, I mean, again, I'm trying. Probably gonna, I, I will certainly screw him up at some point, but I try with, if I haven't already, but I try with my, even with my son to say, you don't need to be upset by something somebody says, that's your choice. And there's also to some degree, and this may be, this is probably a trait I got from my mother and, and her family, just not giving anyone control over you. When you let someone upset you, they have control. And I refuse to give anybody control over me. So I'm not going to be offended by something you say. And I just think that people have forgotten that's a choice on your part. No one can offend you without your permission. Well, and to your point, there's nothing a bully hates more than not getting a reaction. No, reaction. It's, right. it's, 
it's it it's incendiary to see someone just look back at you and smile when you're trying to upset them. Right. Well, that's, and that is something that we have to get to a certain age before we realize, because yeah. Lord knows if I, I'm sure I was given that exact mm-hmm. advice when I was in middle school and I oh, definitely sure. did not have the <laughs> wisdom then to listen to what my parents were, t- my mother was telling me, but. When, you know. when did you come out? What was your age? Um, oh, idle. I, I didn't, kind of, I didn't really convince, I didn't know for sure myself until t- I was 24, I was on idol. And I think all these, all these, I look back and in North Carolina in the early nineties, you were either really flamboyantly gay or you were closeted, you know? Mm-hmm. So I didn't know any gay people when I was growing up. Um, and I, the only gay people who I knew were the dance teacher at my high school. And I didn't even know what that meant. And that was, I just, I think I thought, I don't know. I don't think people understood what gay was. Will and Grace hadn't come on yet. I didn't know what it was. So (laughs) it wasn't until I was in, um, probably in college that I knew what that meant. And then it wasn't until I was in LA for Idol that I met other, I mean, listen, I'm nobody's lumberjack. I get that. But I also was not, I was not as affected as I think some other folks I saw on TV might've been. So I didn't realize until I got to LA and I was doing Idol that, oh, whoa wait, he's gay and he's gay? Oh, then maybe I am gay. I thought I was bisexual. Every, every self-respecting gay Southerner has been bisexual at some point. <laughs> they uh, had to do that halfway house. <laughs> yeah. I used to say, uh, I don't know why, but on Loveline, I used to say bisexual is gay with a publicist. Like you're, <laughs> <laughs> you're, someone is arg- making a case where like, no, no, he's bi, he's bi, come on. Or it's no, just not- the gateway, it's just the gateway drug sure. <laughs> yeah. before you get, although I have, I have in, I used to say that all the time too, but I think I have in recent years realized, listen, if you can be born predisposed to being attracted to women and I can be born predisposed to being attracted to men, why can't someone be predisposed, born predisposed, attracted to both? So I certainly think that it's, it's, it's a valid sexual orientation for people, but it's definitely not for me, even though I tried to pretend it was. <laughs> what is, what's your status right now? Are you married? Do you have a partner? Quarantined. <laughs> with? By my with, damn self. By with, yourself. No, my, well, no, my son's here and he goes back and forth between here and his mother's house. She lives down the street, but um, uh, no, it's just me, single, lonely, die alone. I'm a wait hermit, a so that's How, fine. Wait, how's the mother's, how's that work? You How's see. what work? Your child is eleven. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to do the math. You're no, 41. he was no, no, no. She, 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 and I are very good friends. We were friends. We worked together. She wanted kids. I wanted kids. No romantic oh, right, stuff at all. Right. Okay. We did um IVF, and we co-parent. And she lives not far away. And in the quarantine, it's our it's our opportunity to see my mother um, two times a week. We meet in her backyard, uh, and and wow. do a six foot apart social gathering of just the small family. And then we go. He goes back and forth. My, about, my theory on that is that he might be the most well-adjusted child on the planet, just given say, those stats. Two healthy. loving parents with no conflict who came together because they're friends and truly wanted this boy here and, and conflict-free best friends. From your mouth to God's ear, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he is. <laughs> but he's, you know, we're, we're getting to... I, mean, I don't talk about him usually in public because I figure I'll let him have a, have a private life, but... I'll say this, being a dad is harder at a certain, at a, at when the child is a certain age than it is when they are younger. I'll say that much. <laughs> that. It's a challenge for me. <laughs> well, I can tell you that I'm starting to divide the world into two categories. And some people are reasonable and easy, and some people are just difficult. Difficult adults, difficult kids, difficult neighbors, difficult bosses, difficult employees. and. Right. If difficult partners, husbands, wives, like if you are Daddy, dealing with, okay. <laughs> that's my daughter. <laughs> if you are dealing with a difficult person, it is fucking difficult. And my son is just not difficult. He's kind of wired like a lab. Now that's all wiring. It's not, none of us. It's, it's all nature. I don't think any of it's nurture, but he's easy. So it's like, if you say to him, you know, if he goes, can we go out? to mcdonald's tonight and you go not tonight but we'll go tomorrow he'll go okay and he'll just walk in the house if you do that with my daughter it's a battle and you got to get into it she's difficult 
he isn't difficult. But I'm now starting to really think about adults. Think about like the difficult adults in your life or think about the difficult neighbors you had or the difficult whatever, managers, co co-work, colleagues, whatever it is. Like, and the, the one thing about being difficult is difficult people don't know they're difficult. That's <laughs> oh, the whole thing. Else. Now, if you put two of them together, then they find out because they end up hating each other's guts, <laughs> which is always my favorite. Because <laughs> then the one, they'll each come to you individually and go, God, so and so such a bitch, you know? And it's like, no, no, you're both bad. <laughs> yeah, you don't, and you don't want to be that, per you don't want to be that person who they both come to. Right. Because then they eventually go back to each other and talk shit about you because you, because <laughs> you were honest with them. God forbid. <laughs> so how, how much has this impacted your business touring, playing, performing? Well, I mean, I think it's completely shut down for everybody, right? Um, yeah. I guess what I'm saying is, is obviously it's completely shut you down, but how many dates were you, were you doing? Well, I had limited my, I had stopped really singing publicly a lot um, after I, well, I mean, I did, I did a tour after we did Apprentice and then I, or, or two, and then after I ran for Congress, I stopped touring in general and started just doing, you know, talking as if the people wanted to hear my opinion. <laughs> um, and so I did more of that and I still did probably four or five private events a year. Um, mm -hmm. And that's it. I did a Broadway show with Ruben in, in 2018. Um, that was a, a opportunity he and I got to do together and we did that. But outside of that, I've really just done private events and obviously those are all canceled right now too. So. so what is the political plan versus the musical plan? <laughs> um, well, I don't know. I didn't do a, I didn't stop performing so that I could stay in politics. I stopped because I just realized there's an expiration date on most singers. Right. And I wanted to unlike Unlike some people who we might have been on a TV show with, I wanted to know when my expiration, I wanted to choose it instead of <laughs> pretend that it had not passed. Um, Wait, so. I have to think. Was Tony Bennett? No. <laughs> no. Well, uh, well, let's drill down there on are, that a there little are bit. There are plenty of people who don't really realize when the moment is gone, is, is passed for them. And I don't know that it's completely passed for me. I still can sing here and there. I can still do Broadway stuff, but I, it is passed for me to be on the radio. I'm 41 years old. I'm not gonna be on top 40 radio anymore. That's over. Um, that was 16, 17 years ago. So I started deciding to sing and perform in ways that made more sense for a 41 year old. That's why Ruben and I did Broadway. That's why I've done private events. Um, so. I'm not trying to get on top 40 radio anymore because I think it's like when you were a kid and your parents and you, your parents use the cool words and it just didn't sound right coming out of their mouth. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there are plenty of people, I don't have to name names, but there are plenty of people who, who don't realize that they don't need to be carrying around eight by tens of themselves anymore. You know what I mean? And so part of my reason, part of my reason, he, 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 sung, he sung like a siren. He was a great, <laughs> great So vocalist. I just, I just, so po politics, I don't know. I don't know if I got, have the patience for, I don't think I could get through a primary anymore nowadays anyway. I think I would probably be run out of my own party for not being angry enough. <laughs> Clay, it um, sounds like suicide is pretty, pretty much the next <laughs> right. stop for you. Yeah, it's like I left. <laughs> You know, uh, waking up can be so difficult these days, being 41 years old, sitting up, getting point? out of bed, getting dressed. <laughs> no, I'm not, down, I'm not down myself. I'm being reasonable about the singing thing. I still perform. But politics, yes. Isn't that depressing for everybody? Oh, yeah. Well, you're, I, found, I found doing your show quite, um, I don't know, delightful. Yeah, uh, but you know what? You did it the week, the first week that we had to quarantine. You did the first week that we had had to got rid of the studio audience and people were in that week on the show much more cautiously optimistic about the country not being so divisive and everybody wanted to kind of agree boy that <laughs> shit went out the window in two weeks um oh, really? and people are, i mean it's still it's i think that's what scares me more than anything it's not that i not policy it's the fact that you like what chris christie came out today and said and made a comment about we need to open it up we need to open the economy up and we have to recognize that people are going to die well lord he got trashed from hell for that right and mm -hmm. i think to myself but did he get trashed because it's a bad idea it's the wrong idea or did he get trashed because he happened to say something close to what 
Trump said. And now Democrats are going to disagree with that for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we've gotten to a place where you just disagree with whoever is on the other, in the other party, whether they make a reasonable suggestion or not, you know? And I don't know if I have the bandwidth or the patience to scream and shout at, you know what, and be offended. I don't have the, I'm not going to choose to be offended just because it's expedient to do so. Um, no, I, I agree. And it's, it's, it's bizarre that adults, and, I, and then when I say adults, I don't mean 37 year olds. I mean, 75 year olds <laughs> are carrying on this way, which it seemed nearly impossible when I was a kid, you know, seeing people of this age having those <clears throat> kinds of back and forth. But, you know, it's also just interesting. I was watching Super Bowl three on the NFL network. Uh, they just put it on and watching First off, just the halftime show from Super Bowl three, like a marching band. <clears throat> Those are there's, there's like a giant wedding cake that was made of, you know, cardboard being pushed down the middle of the field. And comically, people in football outfits with like their legs sticking out was literally like shaped as a football and and one of them like fell over and then the other one fell over. Like it Sounds was like a Clay a, Aiken concert to me. It was a hot mess. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they were, they were, they'd show the, the crowd and almost every guy was wearing a tie and a blazer like at, and that was in Miami. That was the, that was the uh, Colts uh, Jets. Jets game. Right. In, in Miami. So here we are in Miami, you know, at a two o'clock kickoff sun's overhead and all these guys are wearing jackets and ties. And I thought, this is a, this is a little bit different now yeah and now they all have the hats on with the beer cans in them right that's right right <laughs> and by the way good luck finding a fat guy in that crowd yeah. either they're all went like 155 pounds but we are at a new place and uh we are going to have to sort of learn to keep walking as as uh, clay said which is not getting not stopping and listening every time somebody throws something out good or bad there's just going to have to, we're just going to have to do more of that. And it's hard to convince people to do more of that because it, it's alluring. It, the siren song of the phone, of getting back on the phone to seeing right. if someone said something about you or responded or something. But we're just going to have to do that because I know we're not wired for this. I, well, it's clear we're not wired for this. To your point, a, a big clickbait headline that Clay, you yourself may have even, you know, had your name in there before. Um, a big trending thing is see how this celebrity clapped back at a troll, and it's like, why do I have to watch this exchange of somebody being mean to a celebrity and then the, the celebrity shitting on the person? But that is such a major clickbait headline for I don't know the last however many years. Listen, clickbait is it, right? It's all clickbait. Right. There's not, and 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 unfortunately, we're lazy we don't click on it. <laughs> like we read the headline and right. then that's it. That's the truth, right? right? We don't right. even click on it. Right. I can't tell you how many people have, and so they, they have to make the headlines more salacious, otherwise we don't click on them. And then someone, they make it salacious, it says something horrible. It's not exactly the truth. You have to read the story to get the truth, but it doesn't matter because if the headline says something, you know, that's, that's, that's all bad. the people are gonna share with their right. friends, so. Right. It's a laziness, and I think that that's disappointing. Do you think it's going to change? I mean, I've, re I've read some people's, I've read some articles with clickbait headlines, but who believe that after this, after this um, correction of, of people's attitudes, we might take things more seriously because of this virus. And I don't, I don't know if I believe it. I really don't know if I do. I, I think my feeling is, everyone is going to be a little bit callous and a little bit numb. And so when you hear a headline that's meant to elicit a reaction, you're going to have less of a reaction, you know, like, yeah, but, like your but body so builds up a tolerance for it. Like you do with, with Percocet, you know, like, like the guys, <laughs> I, but you know, I, you know, I'm not real. I'm not really kidding. Like we're trying to get, we are as human beings basically trying to have, live in homeostasis, you know, just along right in the middle somewhere. And I, I always learned this from Dr. Drew when he would say, oh, I have patients that take uh, 90 Vicodin a day. 
and I would always go ninety a day. It's oh yeah, a lot. And and they would they would work and stuff, you know. And I'd go, how do you do it? And he'd be like, you start with two a day, and then two a day doesn't do anything. That's just two a day makes you even. Well, that's why we're that's why we are not moved by any of the videos or headlines or anything we see because we're so we've we've gaslighted ourselves right really to it but so let me you're you're in la you're all in in the la area right yeah mm -hmm. correct and so the i do wonder sometimes if there's a big difference because if i was living if i was in new york during this i would probably be freaked out i don't know how how the atmosphere is in la around this virus and whether there's a big noticeable difference obviously la is always jam-packed with traffic so i imagine it's visibly different now like it's certainly visibly different in new york but in places like raleigh or places in other parts of the middle of the country i don't know that there's been as much of a visible change i mean my neighborhood's always quiet it's gonna always be quiet it's i'm far away so i don't know if people are taking it as seriously in these areas because we're not seeing the you know the apocalyptic changes and so that's why I'm not sure that it's going to change anybody's attitudes because people really aren't. I don't know that life is that much different for folks in these areas. I think in rural areas, definitely less impacted, you know, from a death standpoint, but also just from a lifestyle standpoint. And one, you know, one byproduct of this is the future has always been a kind of a Blade Runner. Everyone lives on top of each <laughs> other and we all pile into these mass shuttles and nobody has a car and nobody has a, a yard. And, and this was kind of the future. This would, I feel like this may impact that. Like yeah. I feel like people that are thinking of moving into a high rise in Chicago or moving into Manhattan or, right. or Boston are gonna go, you know what, let's get a place on half an acre with a little bit of room. Exactly what out. I was saying. The, I, my, we were just, I was talking to some of my family about that the other day, that in the 70s and 80s, especially here in the South, there was a lot of what they called white flight of people leaving the cities. People who lived in the cities, they all moved out to the suburbs. And recently in places like Raleigh and Charlotte and cities in the South, especially, there's been this draw for people to come and live back downtown. And I have a feeling that shit's mm -hmm. over because you, you know, living in an apartment building, you think about all the germs you're sharing with people all of a sudden. It might be nice if the byproduct was people are planting more gardens and right. uh, being a little more self-reliant and preparing a little bit and l working on their health and immune system. Like there can be a bunch of positive shit that comes from Damn this. Damn good for the home value. I'm setting up, I told you I'm renovating this house trying to flip it. I got two <laughs> acres. Anybody wants to get away from the germs, you call me up. <laughs> Do you have any you have any home improvement questions you'd like me to answer? I will, you're definitely the one to no. I, I'm 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 really ready to screw it up on my own, and I'm afraid <laughs> if I ask you, you'll tell me how to do it right, and then I'll have to really work harder. <laughs> so I don't want to do that. All right. Well, shall we take a quick break and come back and do some uh, news with Clay Aiken? Do that it. sound good, everybody. All right. Let's do that. Let's take a quick break. Come back. Gene will do the news. Clay will hang out. We'll do that right after this. News with Grad, news with Gino Grad, breaking viral, all those crazy Trump tweets. Give me news with Gino Grad, trouble in the Middle East, celebrity drug meltdowns. Keep news with Gina, Gina Grad. The news with Gina Grad. Well, speaking of this crazy virus, Dr. Anthony Fauci dismissed the theory that coronavirus originated in a lab in Wuhan, contradicting what the president and secretary of state said, according to Newsweek. Fauci said in an interview with National Geographic, quote, the best evidence the virus, the best evidence shows the virus behind the pandemic was not made in a lab in China. Everything about the stepwise evolution over time strongly indicates that this virus evolved in nature and then jumped species. Uh, he added that he doesn't believe the alternate theory that somebody discovered coronavirus in the wild, brought it into a lab, and then accidentally unleashed it on the public. And Fauci's statements contradict what uh, President Trump said on April 30th, uh, that he had seen convincing evidence that the coronavirus or originated from China's Wuhan Institute of Virology. And Mike Pompeo kind of echoed that as well. Well, first we heard the wet market and the right. bat. Then we heard the wet market didn't have the bat. Then they 
then we heard it was at the institute uh, the lab essentially right. which is right. also in wuhan and maybe not that far away from the wet market where they were working with some bat something something so then someone connected those dots but is it either is it now either the wet market or the institute is that is that where we're at I haven't heard any other mainstream theories either. the The way the bats one of the one of the theories is the way the bats are cargoed at the wet market um, leads them to a lot of abrasions and, for lack of a better word, leaking. I uh, heard so I heard the bats weren't at the wet market. Where were they? Who cares where the damn bats near, are from? Why bot. are you eating them? Yeah. <laughs> Well, and then, and then one of the theories was the bat that they they trace this back to isn't even a, a bat found in any part of this province. So maybe that's where the lab came in. Isn't it but, plausible that the bat could have bitten someone? Yeah, but I think we'd know that. They or Batman, who knows? Because then we'd have Batman. We yeah. Yes, that's right. They'd be radioactive. So <laughs> Great we origin never, story. <laughs> because, you know, this isn't, as you've said before, this isn't a country that's super forthcoming with this information. No. So I don't know that we're ever going to get a definitive answer. Yeah, but, you know, in situations like this, you look at motivation. China has motivation to cover up, right? I think that certain people would believe that Trump has motivation to have a have an enemy, right? I don't see what Anthony Fauci's motivation is other than just to be a scientist and sort of nerdy and just want facts. And so I don't, I, I'm, I'm drawn to that type of person who just has no time for bullshit. He's got no political motivation to say that it's from China or to say that it's not from China. So I think I trust a scientist in this situation because what's he got? He's been around literally doing that job since Reagan. Yes, and he's he's worked for both parties, you know. He's not trying to be elected decades. to anything. Right. He don't care. He's old enough if it's time to retire. I think he, I just feel yeah. like he's got no motivation to do anything but tell you the truth. No, I agree. Motivation. Look look for the motivation. If there's no motivation, then that's usually the one to, to bet on. Right. Uh but if it's still from China, I'm still pissed at China. So Oh, that's well, that's fine I, too. <laughs> If they hadn't been eating bats, we might not be in this position. And if you didn't want to be pissed at them, were that be pissed because of the murder hornets, the Asian oh, murder. Oh, please, yeah. something else to worry about. God damn it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Those things aren't two inches. We're we are rounding way up with those <laughs> things. No, I think we're rounding up from an inch and a half, though. I don't yeah, feel we like are. Um, we are, but that's, pretty I'm a big. carpenter. That's a lot to me. <laughs> they're, they're big, but they're not two inches. I've been eyeballing those things. And we need uh, we can't have them on a hand. They keep taking pictures on a hand. Somebody, we need a dime for scale. Like yeah. somebody's got to put something next to that thing. I don't really care how big they are. The people who say they've been stung by them say that it feels like hot nails being rammed into your leg. So I don't care if it's microscopic. If it's going to give you that much damn pain, then I don't want it around. Yeah. <laughs> who cares I how big it is? I agree too, but they just, they, they tap into our sort of chromagnum brain, which is they look so scary. Yeah. They look like DC or Marvel came up with them yeah. uh, 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 literally in the, in the drawing room, you know, like they, they speak to us. I Something was having the this, Avengers would have fought. Yes. I had this thought. It's very esoteric. It's going to sound like I took mushrooms, but I mean, <laughs> Strap it. In. here we go. <laughs> This is what I mean. I wrote this down a long time ago, and I've been thinking about it a lot. Our relationship with sort of the aesthetic we've talked about all the time. Cockroaches look nasty and dirty and weird, and spiders look and ladybugs look nice, and butterflies look nice. And we have a kind of we have dogs that look mean. Look at the ocean. There's a bunch of look at that dolphin. Look how smart he is. Oh, he's a good he's dolphin. Smiling. He's a smart dolphin. Like we that jellyfish. Ugh, get him out of oh, here. Put up a picture of a monkfish, Chris. Right. No, don't, don't. <laughs> we we literally go, we have the nice looking stuff and the mean looking stuff, and we sort of judge accordingly, even if the mean looking stuff isn't as bad as the sure. as the nice Weren't looking we stuff. Weren't we taught though those things? Weren't I, we taught I, I, what's I, ugly and what's pretty? I don't know if that's taught. Like I just, I, it's like you see a flower and you go, that's pretty. And you see a weed and you go, that's ugly. And some of it is societal, but also how do you get there as a society? You know what I mean? Like, why did you right. go Listen, there, there in the are, first place? There are societies in, the, in Polynesia where 
the fatter you are, the more attractive you are. And I'm, I mean, that's because I guess back in the day, those people who were larger were eating better yeah, um, well, and, yeah. and therefore that meant that they were rich and for whatever oh. reason that has translated into those folks being more attractive yeah. now which is I exactly why i need to move there well, how's the polynesian <laughs> but i'm saying like how's the polynesian space program working out like i'm saying yeah those are outliers but we don't, don't look at them as models of but society. You, think, you think of babies and the theory about babies that they evolved to have these big eyes and round mm -hmm. faces so it would be something that we were attracted to that we would want to take care of and not abandon so i think and that crop in that that noisy cry right what is what i mean it was cre evolved to be impossible to ignore right well i'm gonna get in the part where you guys think i drank some peyote oh wait you haven't already tea. gotten there i haven't gotten there yet <laughs> i have not gotten there yet first off uh the queen hornet can be two inches but the workers are one 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 to one five that's what i felt like i looking at i felt like i was looking at the one and a half range but anyway here's the here's the high on mushrooms part of this i was thinking the other day while i was driving that's the relationship we have with nature we also have that with people you know when you see in a pilot's outfit and then you show them a picture of a fat guy in a pilot's outfit they think the good looking guy is a better pilot you know that's that's just how we roll but then I thought, you know, we have this with our own bodies and with others' bodies as well. Like there's parts of us that we think like eyes and, and your nose. And we go, oh, those are pretty parts. And then there's parts of us <laughs> that are, we think of as disgusting pretty parts. just within our own parts. Like I wouldn't know the difference between a supermodel's anus and a chick that worked at a greeter at a Walmart anus. Like I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't know. I smell a new game. Yeah. Wait, hold on a second. Yeah. Hold on a second. Are you, are you saying that the anus is an attractive part or an unattractive part? I'm saying unattractive in this, well, this for, scenario. Not for Fair all enough. of us, Adam, on, the, on this, on the show. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, well, I don't know. Just <laughs> looking at an anus, I feel like, uh, but we know, we know what that's used for. Primarily, yeah. it's not that hot, no. But I would, I would venture to guess that there were certain parts that you might think are attractive that might make me queasy. So. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. I know. I wish your stepdad did a better job. So we both agree on those titties. <laughs> and then I started thinking about like your innards and your organs and how like gross and weird. Like when you when you think about the intestines and stuff like that, how we go like, ugh, that's gross. But then if you think about, you know, Giselle Bunch and you go, look how hot she is. And then you go, look at her intestines. You go, ugh. And it's just weird that we're even within human beings, like breaking parts up on each other. Is well, this I, the will agree, part? I will, yes. I will agree with you that this, this does make me think you did mushrooms. Yes. yes that, was the <laughs> that was the thought I had. All right. Well, Oh, it's frozen. Oh, there you are. Yeah, there you are. Okay. What were we talking about? Oh, who doing knows? The news. Yeah. You're doing the news, weren't you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're doing the news. I think we were talking about murder hornets. Uh, so here in California, Governor Newsom, who now everybody knows that name, said this week that some of the state's retail business could be reopening with modifications by Friday. Mm -hmm. So what he's talking about is um, retail items like clothing, books, music, toys, sporting goods, and flowers. Those uh, businesses would be able to reopen curbside. So they just come and uh, drop it off in your trunk. And that could be happening uh, by the end of this week. He tweeted that the order does not include office spaces, restaurants, shopping malls. Uh, phase three of the state's reopening plan, that's going to be more like the hair salons, the nail salons, the movie theaters. And stage four, I don't see that happening for a long time. That's the conventions and the, you know, the uh, WonderCon and, and concerts. And I, I think that's going to be quite a ways away. When we get some goddamn data in that says that some of these barber places can be opened in a safe way or nail salons yeah. or something. Can mm -hmm. we just get going with that shit? Because I feel like the haircut, I want the restaurant and the barber. Those are my, those are mine. I don't know, you guys, who do you have? Butcher, the run, baker, the run candlestick on, maker. The run on the salons. Uh, hairstylists can jack their prizes up if they wanted to as soon oh, as this yeah. is all over because <laughs> that and nail salons but they're the ones who are probably going to be 
I mean, I think those are responsibly the ones that should take a second, right? Well, I don't know if you saw this meme and I don't know where they're doing it, but there was a picture of a woman putting her hands through the mail slot in the door. Uh, <laughs> work on her that way. You gotta do what you gotta do. That's right. I, the one I'm most, have the most selfish vested interest in, but I'm also the most conflicted about, I would like your all input because you all have kids of varying ages, is my, I have, have three-year-olds, is the daycare because it is goddamn relentless here at home with the daughter. She just, she just requires constant attention. We could plop her in front of a screen, but I choose not to. That's we're playing outside, we're playing inside, we're drawing, we're, we're tracing. We're, it's fine, but it's fucking relentless, it man. So, but I'm also hesitant about sending her back to you know, God. school for obvious reasons. Being a parent is tough. You actually have to be around them. <laughs> oh, shit. <Yeah. laughs> and, and that's Listen, keep... I'm having to do long division over here with decimals <laughs> and screw that. That's <laughs> what I keep trying to tell him. I don't like to play with Legos. I don't want to be chased around, but it doesn't matter what I want. It's what, it's what is occupying. Well, I have forgotten everything I learned in fifth grade. And when I try to help him with his homework, he looks at me and says, Daddy, weren't you a teacher? <laughs> I was, I was, but I taught special ed and we didn't do de decimals and division, trust me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm ready for schools to go back to, yeah. but yeah. I mean, I'd rather them take their time and be, uh, handle it responsibly, obviously. I mean, you have, to, you have to assume that if they're going to go to the effort, making the decision to reopen schools is going to be controversial at any point. Daycares so. is going to be controversial. They're not going to do it until they are convinced that they can convince us he that froze. it's going to be safe. Sorry. Um, yeah, I don't see my thing with schools is all the data I hear is it doesn't affect people that are like under 16. I think Sweden obviously stayed open, but their schools stayed open. I don't have any fear for young people. Then there's the part where the young people bring it back to the old people. Right. But I don't have that fear either because I don't live with any <laughs> old people. So I, I send ship schools as soon as they possibly can in my world. And I'm then, also, yeah. yes, I'm no, also not totally sure about the whole I don't know that quarantining is going to end up being the right thing to do. I don't, I don't know. It, it, I, I, I think when the dust settles on this one, I think, I don't know that that will have been the right decision, or at least when I talk to Dr. Drew about it, he doesn't feel that way. Well, I mean, the Sweden didn't. And I mean, the UK, until Boris Johnson got sick, the UK was going to do the same thing Sweden did, which was go ahead and let everybody get it. And, you know, if everybody gets it, and get and gets over it, then we'll have some sort of immunity to it. And then the old folks can come out of their houses, right? Um, I, I'm not a scientist. And I think the concern, at least on my part, is I wish we had something or someone who we could trust making all the decisions. And I think that the, the problem is really that we don't necessarily have one unified voice, right? Mm. That's why we're scared. And the choice is just stay at home because we don't know any better. Right. I think Adam might be frozen again. Yeah. And that's what's also interesting. We have this bit where we talk about who's the, oh, the, he'll, he'll jump back on. Who's the winner of COVID-19? What stories would have been big disastrous headlines right. that kind of yeah. snuck under the radar because we're not talking about that right now. And you know whose name I haven't heard about in three months? Putin. Yeah. Right? Lying low. Right. Not a, not and, and do you, this is, this freaked me out just yesterday when someone reminded me, remember those Australian wildfires that were the biggest yeah. news story? Oh, that, that was, that was this fire. year. Yes. Didn't, that was, didn't that they was do just a, thing, a month or so ago. Didn't they do a thing about that at either the Grammys or the Oscar? One of the award shows they did a yeah. big Australian It was huge. Wildfires. It was the yeah. biggest story. It was the worst thing that could happen to the, to the world and climate change. And, and, and then the universe I, it said, blows well, my mind to remember, to realize that that was 2020. 2020 can kiss my ass. <laughs> <laughs> well, Everything, well, every bad thing we said about 2019, I have, to, I apologize to 2019. Yeah. For that. yeah. I but absolutely. not so bad. <laughs> 2020. <laughs> What I was gonna, what I was gonna say before, because every time we talk about viruses and if kids are susceptible and how does it work, and Clay, you are right in that sweet spot age with with you, your son. Do you understand how insane it is that kids don't get chicken pox anymore? I never had chicken pox. What? I never what? had it. And I, am, and I am. You mute. I actually, I didn't realize. Until, it's interesting you bring that up because I did not realize until just 
uh, maybe two months ago that there was a vaccine for it. I mean, I, I do know now, but oh, I don't I think that. I realized that one, oh. what is it? Rubella or one yeah, of those? Yeah, yeah, uh, NMR. That yeah. one covers it. And I Mom's didn't realize that because I was thinking, you know what, when, when we finally have my nephews or my son get it, I need to stay away. And then I realized, wait a no. second, you're right. It's been eradicated, essentially. <laughs> you were born under a lucky star. I'm the lucky star. I am, yeah. I he was waited born it the out. <laughs> but, but you know what? Also, there is something that I do concern myself. Uh, I get concerned about. I think that this 10, 11, 12-year-old age is, so, is really formative. Like, I don't remember any much. I don't remember too much about, about Reagan. Um, but I certainly remember Bush won and Dukakis sure. and that race and the last yeah. year. And I feel like I, when I think what I, I'm a child of the late eighties, that's why it's, it's disturbing to me that my child is going to grow up being a child of the late 2010s that's and, and the coronavirus. And that's yeah. going to, and what will, what will have, having had grown up during this period, what will that do to this generation, this oh, next that generation. That's, that's interesting, Clem. Uh, you and I are the same age and I have the same, like, I, I have no recollection of Reagan, really. I, do, I don't remember that era. Now I remember oh, the Just Say No with Punky Brewster part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's it. Yeah. Vague memories, but I, I kind of came online like you uh, during the George H.W. Bush era, and I have, you know, distinct memories of that, you know, the recession, blah, 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 Bill Clinton and all that. Like, that was sort of my, you know, I guess that's the age where you sort of come online Right. And just in terms of what's going on in the world politically, maybe I don't know. It's an interesting theory. I don't. I mean, I I just I'm not quite. I do. I will say this, and again, obviously, if I do a political podcast, then you know I'm going to talk a little bit about politics. <laughs> but but you know, I do worry. I don't agree with much of what Reagan did from a policy standpoint. But I will say that I am glad that in my younger years. I remember not the not the substance of what he said, but I remember him coming on after the Challenger exploded. Mm -hmm. I remember George W. Mm -hmm. I remember George H. W. Bush and that calm reassurance of this is what a president is. This is what a president does. They are fatherly type figures, and I feel like I develop something in me because that was what I saw. God, I don't know what kids are going to take away from this one. Interesting. And they yeah. have nothing to compare it to. So right? this, this, is just, this is just normal. And when Brian said before, you know, it, it takes a certain, we would imagine it takes a certain amount of personal strength to uh, come out gay in the South in that time period. And, and, and what is that like? And, and not that you had anything to compare it to either. But when you think of now, we talk about Adam's kids who are young teenagers and right. they say at school, like, oh, we have three gay friends, two transgender it. friends. It's just no big deal. It blows my it's mind. I, re I remember being at a restaurant not too far from the high school I um, went to. And uh, this is maybe five years ago. And there were it was around lunchtime and there were kids who were leaving school for lunch and there were two guys who walked in and they were living out loud, you know? <laughs> and, and I remember sitting there and thinking, Oh my God, they go to the same high school that I go to. I went to and what, how amazing it is. And I graduated, I had a relatively small graduating class of 250 people. What do they say that 10% are gay. So let's round it down. Sure. There were probably statistically, and I'm being real conservative here, at least 10 gay males in my mm -hmm. graduating class. Mm -hmm. Couldn't name another one to this day. <laughs> Could not tell you to this day who right. they were because they haven't still haven't come out. Yeah. Um, right. If they, if, so I'm the only one who has wow. come out and I think to myself, God, what a huge difference and what amazing progress has been made in such a short period of time Lord, what will happen in the next 15 years? Yeah, there are seems definitely, like, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just saying, seems like progress seems to be made exponentially quicker nowadays than it used to be. Yeah, right? that's an interesting- Certain areas, yeah. Too. Yeah, because we can, everything travels by meme, so we all see it at the right. same time. It's <laughs> well, one plus, picture with four words. How much, how much did it blow my mind also to just be reminded not too long ago that in 2007, the year when my son was born, 2008, when he was born, I didn't have, iPhones didn't exist in 07. Yeah. Like I had, when I did Idol, I remember getting so excited because 
we got cell phones on idle from <laughs> AT&T wireless what? and they had two lines of text screening. Ooh, Ooh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dot what? matrix text screen. Rockefeller. <laughs> Clay, another, another funny thing about us being about the same age. I don't know if you played, um, you know, they call it generation X, generation Y, generation Z, blah, blah, blah. Millennials. Mm -hmm. um, our generation has been referred to, and I love this, as the Oregon Trail generation, where yeah. we, we obviously played Oregon Trail growing I up. Sure but the did idea on is that, that floppy ass disc. Yes, yep. we were the last generation to come of age before the internet and also be young for the internet. You know what I mean? Like the internet came of age in our youth. Every, every, other, yeah. every other generation either was before the internet or post internet. Right, right. We had a little bit, although I didn't get my first email address till college. <laughs> I did yeah, not. I, think, I, I, did I may not. have, I yeah. may have not too actually, but I, my, I, I was and, aware of the internet. In and I, and I know, I, God, you, I just feel so old when I talk about all this stuff. I, <laughs> I remember coming home. God, I feel like I'm so old. I remember coming home and the local newspaper had a, uh, like a call in line where you could dial a local number and then you could type in codes and it would give you a, today in history or a trivia game you could play oh. or something but you you know on the on the touch tone phone and i would spend hours on that that was like <laughs> the internet of the of my middle school years i'd call 919-554 whatever the number was and then you'd type in the code and there were maybe 50 different codes trivia or yeah yeah and yeah. you could play the games right. over the phone and i used to get in so much trouble because i'd keep the line busy and i wouldn't answer the call <laughs> waiting because i'd be playing a game and i that was just the coolest thing in the world holy crap and now i don't even have a landline <laughs> you know <laughs> My son well, looks at me like, what? <laughs> and, and he'll never know another life. I remember being little, little, because I'm much younger than both of you oh, yeah. um, by, by half. Incalculable now. Uh, rude. <laughs> uh, and I'm gone. <laughs> sitting on my mom. No, it's not true. Sitting uh, <laughs> on my mom's bed, going, "We don't have anything from our generation. Grandma and Grandpa had the radio, and you guys have the TV. And we don't have anything." And she said, "Well, there's this thing called the World Wide Web. This, you know, that's not a thing. That's not going to be anything." <laughs> Most revolutionary invention since the telephone. Yeah. So have you seen that video? Have you seen that video? If you go back online, it's, it's on there where um, Bryant Gumbel and yes. Katie Couric yep. yep. are introducing what a web oh, email address is. Oh, on what, yeah, on what, what email is, is. What is that symbol? That the A ask, symbol. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yes. My God. What is that? That's I'll, so good. I'll share this just because it's timely and I've never told this before on the, on the show, but Clay, here's what a dork I was. Uh, when I first learned of the internet, my first exposure was in 1995 and it was at Northwestern University and they had blazing fast internet. You know, all the universities had like ethernet back then, right? And did so- Did they really? In 95? I don't know about all the universities, but Northwestern did. I imagine all the wealthy ethernet? universities- my oh, it was shit was, was, it was, my it was shit blazing. Was fast. <laughs> it was, yes, until it was, good on into 2004. It was so blazing you were, fast. You were rich. <laughs> it was blazing fast. And so um, I, I remember them explaining, like, you can look up anything on this World Wide Web, anything you can imagine, just look it up. And I was like, oh, I'm going to look up some Beatles album covers. And I'm looking up like Beatles albums and like all sorts of stuff. And then the second thought was, wait, anything? S-E-X. <laughs> it was like, wasn't even my first thought. It was like to look up porn. My first thought was to look up Beatles albums. Well, I mean, and now we hey, know that's all the Adam internet's Adam for. Back. Oh, oh, Adam's oh, back. Well, Mazel tov. We started, we were talking, we were talking about, uh, about internet porn. That's all, Chris. Oh, and yeah. he's going to be so pissed. That's, <laughs> that's a sweet spot. <laughs> all right, well, I'll, well yeah, my my internet went down and uh unfortunately it's going to be difficult to converse when i can't really see you so gina i think we should just do one more story that i can jump in on and we'll we'll bring it home i concur this one we have to use our imagination for anyway so this will be a perfect one deadline reports that tom cruise is in early discussions with elon musk's spacex and the possibility of filming a feature film in space with nasa this is not a bo booked project yet ra rather it's early discussions according to deadline but they are serious about this and musk company is also currently working on starship that's according to TechCrunch, which is fully reusable spacecraft that would have much more room on board for a film crew to occupy. Mm -hmm. So that might be what's in store for Tom Cruise in the near future. Is Elon still dating Amber Heard? No, he's with Grimes and they just had a baby and this is his sixth son. Damn. 
You know what I love? I love that even the smartest human being on the planet still wants some hot blonde Poonani. <laughs> and he's not, he, he was dating Amber Heard. She was like throwing beer steins at um, Johnny, Johnny Depp. Depp. But what I'm saying is this, you'd think he would be attracted to the second smartest person on the planet or just the smartest right. female on the planet. But the beauty of men is they want nothing to do he doesn't want anything to do with the top two million smartest people in North America. He wants the hottest chick. The great equalizer. Yeah. Well, I don't know if that's I don't know if that's because he's smart or because he's rich. <laughs> I think <laughs> rich I, I don't, smart. I'm not, I, it's hard to know at that point if she if if someone is attracted to the the aesthetic or the wallet <laughs> or the brain, you know. Very good point. How how big a chasm is there going to be between his kids and how pissed they are when they become adults and how cool everyone else thinks it must have been to be an Elon, Elon Musk's kid? You know right. what I mean? Like, yeah. Clay, your, your son's going to like you and no one's going to go nuts. Clay Aiken raised you. They're going to go, oh, that's, that sounds about right. That sounds, that sounds good. <laughs> right. But they won't His even know kids that. are going to be miserable, right? They'll be living in space. They won't care. <laughs> oh, it's, it's a good, a good point. point. Where, yeah, they, where they, that's right. Space, where they can't hear you complain. <laughs> <laughs> and by the All way. All right, let's bring it way. home. Gina, sorry. Okay, we'll we'll do this Go tomorrow. Ahead. Elon's Elon's uh, liquidating all of his earthly belongings. We'll talk about that tomorrow. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Gina, Gina Grad. That was the news with Gina Grad. Well, let me try a little quick Geico here. Do you own? Do you rent? Do you want to bundle? Well, you should with uh, Geico. Get your homeowners or your renters insurance put together with your automotive insurance. Put it all under one roof at Geico. That's geico.com. Go there. Get a quote. See just how much you could be saving when you bundle at Geico. Geico.com. Uh, Clay, I wish I could uh, see you, but uh, I will certainly plug you, and not in the biblical sense. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Well, it's all the hot anus talk. Um, <laughs> right. And the, the fact that I'm sitting here with no gonna... pants on. <laughs> <laughs> how the heck are we going to get along? This is a great podcast. I was uh, privileged to be a part of it on episode three. New episodes every Thursday on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well. And Twitter and Instagram at Clay Aiken, A-I-K-E-N as well. Um, Thanks, Clay. Always appreciate you being part Absolutely. of the show. Absolutely. Love doing it. Always. Uh, and uh, whenever you want me back on your show, just say the word. The word and has been said. Oh, good. <laughs> good. Thank you. Good sports coming up next. And uh, until next time, Sam Crawford, Clay Aiken, Gina Grand, Mole Brian saying, Mahala. <laughs>